Okay, so um, when and how did you decide, I, I feel like I've got to ask this first, when and how did you decide that the spot was going to be the centerpiece, like your main villain? And as well as that, I was hoping you could tell me a bit more about his living ink portrayal. Pretty early on, we knew the spot was going to be our main villain without an awesome villain that you sort of can understand their, their through line. You don't really have a, a strong story for your, for your main character. So he's an awesome sort of opposite to Miles. And his living ink really is just, I think we've all been saying, it's like an effect. It's, 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 it's artistry come to life. It's something that can really only happen in animation. If you can imagine Spot like a dude in like a sock suit in a live action Spider-Man film, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's not gonna work. <laughs> it's just not gonna work. Um, so he's, you know, he's art come to life. He's the, the inkwell spilled on the page. It all goes back to sort of comic books and comic book art. If you even look at the first film, if you had polled people and said, okay, you're gonna make a Spider-Man film, who should the main villain be? I don't think anyone would have said the Kingpin. Mm. You know, he's actually, I would have said, oh, that's a daredevil villain. Right. So he doesn't have any superpowers, um, but he's a smart crime boss, intelligent, but you know, he had such a strong story that was, uh, I think, the perfect complement to, to Miles and his crew in the first film. And similarly, his spot, from the very beginning, he just seemed like endless potential, both visually and the arc of the character. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, by the way, that's not a costume. That's his skin, by the way, that he's wearing. It's not, <laughs> he's right. not a guy in a, right, right. In a, in a polka dot yeah. suit. That's actually his, his, his skin. And um, so, you know, the arc of, of, of Dr. Own spot is, is one that does really complement without giving away the story, it does complement the journey of Miles in this film really well. You spoke before about um, the sort of the artist's hand come to life, um, and that got me thinking about uh, the portrayal of Gwen's world in the uh, presentation in Earth 65, I think. Um, I w <laughs> I got, I've got the numbers filed away. <laughs> Thank you. I spoke before about developing uh, new animation tools to uh, bring Gwen's world closer in line to the visual definition of the comics. Mm. Um, and I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about uh, any other techniques that you use to define that dimension. I mean, the, the exciting thing about making the first movie or making the second one, and the great responsibility is to always like think about the story and to always think about the emotions and that are driving it. And this character, this journey, um, of Miles that he's going when he leaves home he goes across the Spider-Verse and if we're going to go to these other universes that since we know Brooklyn since we know 1610 mm -hmm. like you, we started thinking about really early on like what is this emotional journey like what's what's a style that could feel like for the dark part of his journey what's what could that look like? And for the for for the light a fire in my head. <laughs> it's it's not near you anymore. Sorry, sorry, sorry. For the for the lighthearted part of the journey, what's a style that could and when we see Gwen, we thought of Gwen as like being this very emotional, like, you know, sort of nine like nineties emo kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we looked at her comics and we were like, okay, her comics have this style that really seems to support that kind of emotional kind of quality that we wanted to portray and we sort of started thinking of all the different tools that it would like kind of work with that and then so that sort of led us to just by looking at the comics and, and sort of breaking them down we saw there's this, like, um, with these watercolor washes and these sort of dry brush effects and and the characters were the way they were using color and stuff. So we had to think of, so the, the, the artists at Imageworks have had to think of tools to do their lighting a different way. Because mm -hmm. all these universes, like Miles' universe in the first movie, um, the way we handle depth of field, how, does, how would it look like if there's, no, if there's depth of field, if you're living inside a comic book with this CMYK offsetting kind of thing, it's native to a comic book. But if you're in a different comic book with a different style, then you have to think of all these new rules. So the way lighting is handled in Gwen's world, the way um, the texture on her skin is handled when she's in her own universe. Because conceivably, all these characters have their own rules from their own comics. Okay. And so we had to think of rules for how the camera could move and how the camera couldn't move. It can't move quite the same way. That style 
of drawing sort of limits how you, and should, it, it sort of changes how you approach camera as opposed to Miles' universe, which is a little bit more naturalistic. So I could go on and on and on, but there's a million tools we've had to develop to create all the, to her dimension. What made me get it was when Gwen's dimension was described as a mood ring. Right. And that's what we tried to show yesterday. It's like the, the mood of the character impacts everything going on in the world around them. And that was such a cool idea to me. I was like, oh, wow, I've never seen anything like that. And of course, the first thing I did in is ask, is that going to actually work or is it going to look stupid? Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the cool things about working on this film is that the team gets to work on trying to execute this idea that in some cases you don't even know if it's going to work. And then you see it and you go like, oh, wow, that's really... <laughs> I'm, I think sometimes even I don't know what to expect <laughs> from, from some of these concepts until, until we see them up on screen. And figuring out the look of Gwen's world was something that um, I think gave a lot of folks anxiety for me personally, but also was really satisfying to finally, you know, see it up there and see it reflected, especially, and that's what we chose to show such an emotional moment between, between her and her dad, was because you could see it actually, you know, working at its full strength. Were there any other, uh, like, new tools or looks that you were particularly excited about, like, moving on to, like, the other universes? <sighs> Nothing that I could talk about without giving away more <laughs> of the film. Right. I mean, you, you, you definitely saw at least two other worlds teased in the teaser, mm -hmm. um, but we, we're, we're not at liberty to kind of go into detail. But th let's just say the world that Miles first falls into in the teaser um, is, is probably one of the most, I think, dynamic and exciting um, mm -hmm. worlds that we've got in the entire film. And that's, that's one that I, uh, man, I can't wait for, <laughs> for people to see a little bit more of that. You mentioned in the presentation uh, Rick Leonardi and Brian Stelfreeze as part of your uh, visual development teams mm -hmm. when it came to working on the textures of the characters. Um, I was wondering if uh, you could talk about who else you might have like drawn in to uh, impart their knowledge in the same manner. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking about Chris Anka, who's actually on our team. Chris Anka, he's been an, an amazing. Um, Sanford Green. Um, who's uh, another artist we all really love who, who's been involved here. I mean, I'll hand it to one of you. Um, and, and, there's, and that's a tradition that started with the first film. As fans of comic books, uh, you know, our whole lives growing up, you know, and you watch... We, we, we love all these movies that come out about... They're based on these comic books we grew up with and stuff. But there's something about being able to connect directly with the artists who actually created them and that joy and that and that, that they gave you and to be able to like include them on your journey of making this film is one of the best parts of making it is that it feels like oh I'm getting to work with my heroes I'm getting to work with the comic book artists that I love right. and that we're all getting to work on these things and bring them to life together we're not leaving them behind and forgetting that they got us there and 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 it's not to say that, you know, I don't love these other movies. It's just a special part of this journey that I think is really important to us and I think the fans of these movies. And we just are trying to do more of it. Um, and I don't know, that's, it's just, it's a joy. They're like the unsung heroes because all the work that they do ends up turning into these massive franchises. So let's make sure that we keep them in the fold. And Chris Anka, can speak directly to it. I mean, he's redesigned so many of these characters' costumes. <clears throat> and so now to be able to carry it through into its like next iteration, to have him there along for the ride, it's, it's a kind of a no-brainer. When you think about it, you're like, why didn't other people do this first? But happy we were the ones. I mean, that's what excites me so much about these movies is their connection with the visual language of comic books as well as just yeah. like the iconography. I think just seeing things like the Bende process and like the Kirby crackle in the mm -hmm. first one made me so excited. But actually on that note, was there any uh, like new textures that you brought into this one that you were quite excited about? Like any old like classic techniques? <laughs> I will say, it, it was, maybe it was a little hard to notice, but Brian Stelfreeze did this amazing thing where he literally took like what would be the same texture from you know, 10 feet away, 50 feet away, 100 feet away, and he breaks it down how he would in the comic books. So the fidelity is, it's not like we're just disappearing material. It's, it's being right. reorganized and changed to, to mimic his hand. 
And that, like, those little bubbles are invaluable for the texture artist, for, for everybody, for the people that are building the software that's going to allow the characters to recede into the distance. One thing that is really exciting, again, to go back to the spot and how excited we are that we got to reveal him to audiences and to hear the oohs and ahs and the gasps that we got, you know, when he started, when, when they saw a little tease of a little bit of animation. Um, I mean, that was kind of amazing for me was to to sort of create these ink these ink, these ink spot techniques um, that tool has taken a year to develop mm -hmm. that's a custom tool that was designed by Imageworks and they've built and refined and refined and refined these things all have to work in 3D space we're making a cinematic experience for a theater. Like it, we're not making something for a small screen. It's not something for a three inch window mm. on your phone. It's, it's something that needs to appear in depth in screen, on screen. And one thing that I said when we were making the first movie is like nothing, I don't want anything to be a cheat. I want it all to work in space. I want, you know, and, and I tried to encourage a lot of people to go see the movie in 3D. It's a different experience. Mm. I wanted to make, if you go see the movie in 3D in IMAX, all those dots, all those hatch marks, they all travel through space and depth. It isn't just on the screen. It isn't just projected at surface level. And same thing with these ink spots. I want them to actually move in three-dimensional space as well, not just be, and that, and, and I want them to feel and look and move, and spot is gonna be you guys saw a tease. I think he's going to blow people's minds. We've had to develop probably, just for that character alone, I think Imageworks has developed about 17 new tools. Wow. He's a walking effect, the spot, which, you know, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that was maybe the first thing that struck me after thinking, like, wow, the spot, <laughs> like, not, not a name that immediately, like, um, would when I think Spider-Man Rogue, he's not uh, the most obvious choice, but then it's just so perfect. Jerk. Yeah, I know. I mean, it was funny. I was like, oh, everyone thinks I'm joking. Yeah, it's the spot. <laughs> it's really the spot. But I think by the end of the presentation, they they got the potential that that we've been of what we've been working with working with. And and you know, like I said, his his journey so wonderfully complements Miles's journey in this film that when you hopefully when you see it. Just like in the first one, you couldn't imagine it being someone other than a right. kingpin running things. I think in this one, you won't be able to imagine it being anyone other than the spot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Jason Schwartzman just like so embodies this character in such a great way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the other thing. There's this, there's this performance element too that I'm really enjoying with this, with this film. I mean, just. I've worked with a lot of actors, but you, you get these, you got this like top caliber cast. And I give a lot of credit to the folks with the, with the first film. It made such a fan of so many actors that it felt like everyone was open to now wanting to be a part of, right. of, the, of this journey. It was not a hard sell to, to get anyone really involved in the film. And, and they're giving some pretty, I mean, I think you saw a little taste of it. Like, you know, getting, I love Shea Wiggum from like Boardwalk Empire. To, to get him in as Gwen's dad, and he this is his first animated film, so he's never done voiceover work before. Oh. So he's just giving you this powerful, dramatic performance, and and it's it's pretty amazing to that that the, the people who've just been in, coming out of the woodwork just saying, is there any part that I might <laughs> <laughs> that might work for me in Spider Verse? Because I think everyone's kids love Spider Verse too, so it, it makes. Uh, it's the the fandom. Uh, you you really realize the impact that the that first film had leading up to this because it's just every little bit of detail that comes out about it. People seem to go crazy about. It's pretty exciting. I actually wanted to ask you about uh, your work before um, Spider Verse uh, because to me your previous work is in part kind of capturing these moments of kind of black culture and black history within quite confined spaces. Like I think about the barbershop in Seoul and I think about the hotel room in One Night in Miami. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of struck me that you're now here working in what feels like almost inf infinite space. 
Um, and I just wanted to ask about your feelings on working with that sort of possibility. Well, I, I work the same, you know, like, I, I mean, a great example, a, a sequence that I've been very passionate about and worked really hard on is the one you saw yesterday in the counselor's office. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, I, I love personal moments. I, I love character moments. Uh, I love those smaller, I love them. Ultimately, I love emotional moments um, because you can, no matter how tightly you plot a story, if you don't feel something, then, then it's not really going to be successful. So going through this entire journey, it's, it's great to have cool action. It's, it's great to have, you know, dramatic effects. It's, it's great to have all these great tools. But I think the, the icing on the cake is like, how do we feel? And, and that's something that I bring to, to everything that I do. And I've told, I think that's part of the reason why Chris and Phil wanted me to, to be involved and these guys wanted me mm -hmm. to be involved in, in this film is because uh, ultimately we've said it a thousand, we've been saying it all day, ultimately this is a story about Miles Morales and his family. Yeah. And that's like right in my wheelhouse <laughs> because <laughs> I saw the first film while I was working on Soul. Um, they actually brought it to Pixar and gave us a preview screening before it came out in theaters. And I remember going like, well, that's different, you know? And then I started on this film the week after we wrapped Soul. So it, it felt like a very natural project to jump onto um, and it felt like a very natural story for me as a storyteller to, to be a part of telling. What excited you most about like the dynamics between Miles and his parents specifically? Just kind of going off the. Oh, it goes. Scene. It's so different. Peter Parker. When you look at Spider Man, I, I we we always laughed about the fact that like Miles actually has a nuclear family and he's got two helicopter parents, yeah. and one of them's a cop. And his mom <laughs> is as observant as a cop. So the whole thing with Peter Parker and his secret life. Aunt May isn't the most observant person in the world, and it was pretty exciting. This kid who, his family is the most important thing in the world to him, and this is a very close family. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, this kid who's so close to his family who doesn't hide anything from them has secrets. Yeah. And that's a big part of like what was exciting about the, the journey of this film, not just for Miles as a character, but me also as a parent. Um, when it's like, oh, we're going to age him up a little bit. He's going to be about 15 years old. And you get to this point when you're a parent where you're with your teenager. And on Monday, there's nothing your teenager won't talk to you about. And then by Friday, you're like, are you building a bomb in your room? Like, <laughs> and, and that's kind of where Miles is right now. So it's something that also as a parent really, really excited me to, to, to dig into with this film. I was wondering what, uh, if you wanted to talk through what excited you about Miles' journey in this new film. I mean, I think that's it. Like we've been saying, it's, it's sort of this thing that we've been saying the, the entire day. <clears throat> I think that moment in the counselor's office yeah. got like the biggest reaction. Everybody, it was like seeing old family and feeling their evolution, seeing Miles' evolution, that charm. Without that, the rest of this stuff doesn't matter. It all falls apart. So... <clears throat> I mean, I can get caught up in staging the most bombastic action stuff, and I do. I go off the rails sometimes, and it gets crazy. But I think, you know, you have to you have to be able to feel what the characters are going through, or it's or it's meaningless. So to me, that it is the most exciting a aspect of it. It's the, it's their their familial evolution. I wanted to ask actually about uh, what you said about Miles' build, uh, because you said that his movement style had changed because just because of the change in height and his uh, more athletic mm -hmm. frame. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, I mean, that's another thing too. As a parent, you know, I got a six-year-old and he's in soccer and he made this insane leap. And I don't know how it happened or when it happened, but he was one human on one day. And then we went to a game and he scored like four goals and he was coordinated, and I was like, where, where did this come from? So I think Miles, you know, he's on an advanced version of that journey, but seeing him, he's, he, he's not tripping over his own feet anymore. He's, he's capable, he's confident, he knows what he's doing, he's been doing it for a while. His body is still a little gangly, but it's filling out. He's knowing, he, he's understanding his body now. So I think it's, that's a big one, you know? And the fact that we sort of have this rule that he doesn't really do the classic Spider-Man moves. You know, you won't see him do the, like, big legs over the head, Todd McFarlane, crazy poses. They're totally cool and great, but Miles has his own way, and he's had to come to it on his own. It's, it's a lot of back and forth and debate, and we push for different things, and 
I remember there was a period of time when I was pushing, I think, the hardest for putting some peach fuzz on Miles, but I lost the fight. People were like, no, we can't put peach fuzz on him. <laughs> but I was really behind the idea of like putting some peach fuzz, that, that ratty, nasty 15-year-old peach fuzz. But I think the folks who, I think everyone was right. I'm like, yeah, we don't want to make him too disgusting because I'm like, he's 15, he's pretty gross. <laughs> right, right about now. Thank you so much for your time. That was really wonderful.